we can see who else is here. And Live then, streaming is on. Oh, <laughs> it's so loud. <laughs> so loud. Uh, oh, I like the color scheme. <laughs> Sorry? I like the, the color uh, scheme. I um I noticed that uh, on the website I it, there's no black on there, so I tried to make it some dark gray. But I um I noticed that the color theme had been blue, some grayish, and so I I tried to keep with that the, that theme. Right. Um, so it goes through um. Uh, I like how Robertson opens up with some basic quotes from Epictetus. Yeah. I thought that would be good to kind of just state those uh, principles that psychiatrists take. And then I go through a basic list of some of the founders. Um, I didn't know where to put this slide, but again, I can just mix mix, mix them up. But I don't think it really matters with a small group. Um, yeah. I put some of the, oh, if one, one is incomplete. Um, um, I took uh, th three of yours and uh, two of mine, um, and then, uh, yeah, and then I actually created a PowerPoint for an actual summary, cognitive theory of emotion, uh, REBT. Uh, yeah. I basically list the entire list that Robertson lists, which I thought would be useful because um, yeah. uh, if we're talking talking about that in the second hour, I could put this slide up and we can talk about what might be useful in our lives. So I thought it would be good to, because if I remember last time you and I were the only one basically speaking. So if I put yeah, this I slide up, maybe other people could like look at it and actually actually say something that they would like to uh, comment on. So cool. Uh, and then it just, yeah, I know. Uh, and then it just ends with, um, a few last words, which I thought were some takeaways. Uh, and then a list of uh, references. So something something basic, I thought, to help us out. Maybe maybe it attracts people or maybe it, um, uh, but um, <laughs> maybe it, uh, maybe I, I can post this in the future. I can post this a day before in the, in the description so that people can, can see what they're up for. Um, I hope that, um, see, uh, in the past few weeks, I've noticed eight or nine people, maybe six of them come up in our meetup meet chats, but I noticed only two or three in the last couple of weeks. I don't know if that's because I've been sending out more notifications for the website. So, mm -hmm. um, I, maybe, maybe there's more, um, but I only saw one person who, uh, registered for the event on the website. So. And I think that was Ava. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, I, I saw someone uh, I asked repeat on a meetup, and now he disappeared. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And a friend of my brother's. Uh, heard that it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's online, so he said he might uh, join um, oh. from, uh, from Israel. So, I mean, I think, I told him it's fine, <laughs> even if it, he's not in, uh, in Berlin. Um, yeah. No, of course, I mean, it, it, if it's online, you could be anywhere in the world and it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And there are ways in which what I want to say. And there are ways in which Was a um. Hmm? Uh, I've been listening to a uh, the Stoic psychology podcast. 
And there's a Stoic Psychology podcast. Yes. Ooh, okay. Um, just a second. Uh, Did I send you the uh, research? Research you thing? sent me. I, I read that research article you sent me about um, how they uh, they did an, an actual study on stoicism's effect on working yeah. memory. Um, yes. Unfortunately, I tried to I tried to look at it today actually and uh, and uh, screenshot the pages, but uh, mm. I guess I have to refresh my browser because the uh, access is now limited. Oh. But um, and I realize sure. that's a. I realize now that that's a. Um, that's good that you 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 sent me that because after reading Robertson's work, there's not a lot of research on how like, actually rigorous research on how stoicism affects people. So, <laughs> hmm. uh, what what is that podcast called? Oh, okay. I found also his uh, his blog. So, is a Stoic psychologist. So, um, one of the researchers, Alexander McKellen, uh, mm -hmm. started the uh, this um, this podcast in September two thousand nineteen. So. And he has Don Rollins oh. on the interviews. Um, and uh, Tim uh, uh, Lebon uh, interview. It's just, yeah. Hmm. Really good uh, resource. Um, I mean, I can send you the, the Google uh, podcast uh, link. Uh, yeah, because I don't, is it called, I guess it's called the Stoic Psychologist. Uh, I can't find it in the um, podcast service I have. But... Yeah. May... Oh, no, it's the Stoic Psychology podcast. Wait. The oh, the Stoic The blog is the Stoic Psychologist. Okay, yeah. Um... I feel like... Uh... I've been really immersed in, in this topic. Uh, Hello. Hello. Hey, Philip. It's good to see you. Hi. I guess. How are you doing? We're good. I'm good. How are you doing? How have you been? Uh, so so. Um, Wait, let me see if I can make this a little bit better. No, this is terrible. Um, yeah, it's been um, trying, um, rough time, but um, you know, uh, you always have good times and bad times, and um, yeah, that's that's what we have to deal with sometimes. So I'm okay. Um, yeah. How has um, how has it been while I was gone? I've seen lots of uh, different names in the um, uh, in the Telegram group. There seems to be um, a lot of new interest. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, just saying, um, we are recording uh, the meetup. So. Okay. So what you're saying is I should go in front of my uh, impressive bookshelf or something that looks more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a um, it's a good point. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm not sure I'm not sure if that's it'd be interesting to do a survey and to see um, how many of those newscasters and other people you see. Uh, ordinarily have a bookshelf behind their computer or just did that for for the pandemic yeah i mean apparently you can just buy book collections uh, <laughs> just for offices and such 
Uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, books in bulk, which is not something I ever <laughs> thought you know, I would have used to for. You know, that, that sounds like the... Um... There's a social media phenomenon, just like that. It's um how you can buy you can buy friends on Facebook or you can buy followers on Instagram. It sounds just like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely. <laughs> I I'm more surprised than I should be at what you said um, about being able to buy books uh, books in bulk. Like I I shouldn't be as surprised about it as I am because like if you know it's like if it's a way of making yourself look smart or educated or whatever i'm sure there's a business around it um so yeah i shouldn't be surprised but i still am like it's pretty brilliant yeah same i mean i was surprised uh, to learn uh, this fact but pretty not cool yeah Right, so Steve, uh, did you manage to find uh, the podcast? Uh, you know, I was searching for it in my, I'll do it right now, just in my browser, because I, I searched for it. I have a um, non-Google uh, um, yeah. on a free Android app store, sec, uh, podcast app store, and I don't, I don't find it there. Maybe it's in the uh, Google one. I can, um, I can just basically listen to it through my browser. Yeah. I'm using something it's called like psychology. FM. And it's there. Uh because I think they have it. Yeah, I think they um yeah. It's on a um they have a completely different website for it. They have a um which was interesting because I, I with the website you sent me for the Stoic psychologist, they have he has a different website for his podcast. It's completely oh. separate actually. Weird. Yeah. All right. Hmm. Hi, Ava. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. So I think um, I think Shrikam had already started um, the uh, streaming. Um, and I think I remember last time it ended, right? It ended after an hour or no, it was the it was the recording. I was recording for the first hour. And then it just cut us off after that first hour. And then Ava picked up the um, the oh. YouTube streaming, I believe. If I remember that, it was like there was a after the one hour. Yeah, mark, it, it, you're right halfway, about that. Yeah, but I think I think with YouTube there is no limit in time because you use Dropbox, remember? But for YouTube we won't have that issue, so no problem mm. today. Mm. So already recording with uh, your. Um, uh, stream key. Yeah, so maybe we wait a few more minutes to formally start everything, yeah. and then um, uh, somebody new, somebody old, somebody else to uh, to come on. Um, somebody blue. <laughs> you need something old, something new, something blue. <laughs> There is a, um, uh, by the way, there is in my research, and I haven't read it yet because I've been doing more more research yeah, on the. Um... Hi, Marcus. Um, I've been doing more research on the actual um, benefits of CBT and this connection between CBT and stoicism. What I found in my research that I um, I haven't read yet is a book. Um, by a recent psychotherapist who uh, talks about the disadvantages of cognitive behavioral therapy mm. and how he actually went back to its roots, uh, re-evaluated its assumptions, and then said that what's wrong with that is not the stoic connection. Like he, he said that there were stoic roots that were good, but that the implications or conclusions modern or very contemporary CBT specialists um, say are, um, uh actually not mm, I, I don't know what he says exactly it's a it's a book though i kind of wanted to i kind of wanted to make this a two-parter like victor frankel and then read a little bit more research on cpt for next uh next week i'm trying to find it here uh, 
Yeah, I think this is Ooh. it. Mm. Hello, Abdul. Yeah, it's called um. Uh... Oh, hi, Abdul. Just saw you there. Um. Yeah, and and this book called um. It's still loading, but uh, unfit for therapeutic purposes. I could put this at the end of the the slideshow. Cool. Uh, unfit for therapeutic pieces, uh, purposes. The case against REBT. Um, the case against actually um, rational, emotive, and cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I'll, I'll post the link at the end of the slideshow and then send it to you guys because that's um, uh, be quite interesting to see what the flaws he has found in the theory itself. Because hmm. I think I was actually surprised to hear that cognitive behavioral therapy was developed in the 50s. I don't know if that makes me feel like it was, I think it, to me that made me feel like it was older actually than I thought it was. I had no understanding of the history of CBT. And so when I realized it was formally developed in the 50s, I was surprised actually that it was that far back. I thought it was maybe a 20, 30 year phenomenon, but this actually is a, uh, a theory more, much more older than that. So, um, Welcome, everybody. Uh, we have Shakam, Philip, Eva, Marcus, and Abdul here. Um, I'm pretty sure we've all introduced and met one another before. Um, uh, so uh, we could pass introductions, I think, though that's what we usually do, and uh, be on our way with CBT. Um, I've prepared a presentation. This was something different we're doing this week. Um, I'm not going to lecture at you at all. This is, uh, that would be something that we would do if, let's say we set up a whole different meetup specifically as an introduction to stoicism, for example. So I would prepare a presentation, do a little bit of a lecture, but for us, it's not necessary. So we can switch between slides. Um, it's just a helpful visual to, let's say, if we start talking about um, uh, rational emotive um, behavioral therapy, I can switch to that slide. We have a visual to help us just um, stay on target. That's all. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen with you. So let me... No, it's not what I want to do. There it is. There it is. So, oh, I didn't realize there'd be lines on here. <laughs> so, um, the stoic roots of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and so a lot of the texts we, we shared with each other were just um, basic texts. They were just introductions. Um, uh, but um, I'll skip to the light frogging because I think we can just skip between the other slides. As I said before, we can skip between the other slides as is necessary. Um, but Shakam had put in a, a few light frogging that we could, um, or prompts that we can we can investigate. And, and then I added a couple of others. And so we don't necessarily have to go in order, but I think this is a good trend. If we start from top to bottom, um, we kind of go through the whole gambit of um, what is CBT, um, what kind of value then does, Stoic, does Stoicism have uh, for therapy? Um, how does it help us? How are they different? And then what would we prefer? So I think it's a nice order in which we can we can investigate these prompts. Um, but um, if we start with question number one, which doesn't specifically reference CBT, I think it'd be interesting to ask the basic question, which I think some of the founders of cognitive behavioral therapy had done, uh, is what do you think about the therapeutic value of stoic practices? Uh, right? I mean, that's, um, if you guys remember the, um, the first um, founders of CBT, um, they basically took most of their theory, uh, at least partially, from an influence by stoicism, especially especially what I saw, it wasn't even uh, most 
of everybody I think who come to these meetings, I think most people would often say Seneca influenced them. Maybe Marcus Aurelius, but Seneca I hear more often. But actually, um, it was quite interesting to hear that Marcus Aurelius and um, uh, um, Epictetus were actually the the more prominent Stoics that the CDT specialists had. Um, uh, had mentioned and had taken away from their, their main points. Um, I don't have, I'm gonna stop talking now. I'm gonna ask anybody else if they wanted to um, share a thought and how um, perhaps uh, using some of these quotes, um, for example, um, Epictetus, his famous quote, men are disturbed not by things, by the views which they take of them, which is a nice connection uh, Robertson makes to uh, modern and contemporary psychotherapists um, a common line uh, that they give to clients, people are not emotionally distressed by events, by their beliefs about them. It's quite surprised. Basically, they they copied stoicism. <laughs> they just they just copied and pasted some of their some of their lines that they use in their actual therapy sessions. Um, and so I'm actually quite glad that Robertson and, and his other contemporaries are making these efforts to show the connections between Stoicism and CBT because it uh, I think it would be a disservice to Stoicism if CBT kind of just completely forgot about it. Um, so I was really happy to read all this text. Uh, but I was what I was going to say is that I can't see my screen and because I am sharing this with you guys. And so I can't see whose hand is raised. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, perhaps uh, Shrikam, uh, you could, uh, I'm just asking you if you could maybe manage that and see if um, if, if, if you want to speak, that's okay. And if, if you see somebody else's hand raised, you could um, maybe manage um, whose hand that is. Uh, sure, sure, I'll try. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, what do you guys think? Just I'll leave it open to everybody because we, we've really met each other already and we've um, uh, understand each other, understand a little bit about stoicism already. What, what do you guys think when you guys investigate a little bit of CBT? Like anything surprising, any takeaways, any... Um, surprising maybe applications of stoicism that they that they discussed uh, right so i can go uh, of course um yeah so i think um when people are going to say some of the reasons um, for people to seek a, a philosophy and to seek a psychotherapy um, are very similar and sometimes uh, the same. And uh, I, I find it, uh, um, I mean, interesting, but not very surprising that a lot of the answers uh, people came uh, back then and also uh, uh, like today or in modern times are very similar. And yeah, the locus of control uh, from uh, Epictetus is such a central um, idea both, uh, I think, my understanding of uh, stoic um, resilience uh, and um, and the way of uh, facing uh, difficulties and obstacles, and I think also it's it's very central uh, to CBT and um, yeah the therapeutic. Uh, techniques mm. around it. Mm. Mm. And um, it, uh, yeah, it also didn't surprise me that, um, and, and stop me if somebody else is, is uh, attempting to speak, but um, it didn't surprise me as well. Uh, it, it kind of did in certain ways, um, but uh, what, what really was interesting was um, I think studying CBT makes you actually look at specific elements of stoicism you never looked at before. 
which I thought was interesting. Like it, there were there were certain things you could take away from stoicism you actually never knew about until you actually examined CBT. Um, and even more than that, I I'm wondering because I think it was last last meeting, I was making the claim or maybe maybe making a making a hypothesis that perhaps the Greeks didn't think of the word, let's say, ethics, as we do. And today we hear, hear something is ethical or moral. We tend to associate it with something, or we tend to impart on it some sort of spiritual element, not just a logical element that I think this, or a practical element, the Stoics thought of. But we, we tend to think of it as, I wouldn't call it as spiritual, but moral. Like it's just, it just sounds different than what than what the kind of practical logical um, uh, feeling that Stoics had with ethics, and I think the same thing could be said about their their philosophy. That um, this kind of makes sense. I mean, now that I think of nineteenth century philosophy, you now Greek philosophy, Hellenistic philosophy, that they didn't. I don't think they really would have distinguished between philosophy and psychology. To them, it's just how is the best way to live, and that to them means. Um, how is the best way to think? How is the best way to deal with your circumstances? Which to them is just as much philosophy as it is psychology. Yeah, so it didn't really surprise me, but I would like to, um, I think this keeps coming up that maybe, I don't think soon, but maybe down the road, we kind of bookshelf a, um, a whole topic on the language of, of how the, the, that the Greeks used and how it influenced their thought processes. Because um, it's just, to them, it must have been so basic to think this. Like if they if they if they created this philosophy so foundationally back then, it must have been so obvious. Not perhaps not obvious, but um, logical. I guess they would say. Yeah. Um, but we'll need somebody who understands more uh, ancient uh, Greek and such. Uh, so uh, Philip, and then uh, then Abdul. Uh, great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm muted, I think, right? I find it so hard to see sometimes in the loop. Okay. No, perfect. you're um, yeah. perfect. Um, so yeah, um, I can, um, part of what I wanted to say, and um, you've already touched on, um, about, um, uh, the, the connection between, um, what uh, an ancient Greek person would have thought about philosophy, which is kind of a, um, a therapy for the mind um, is what I've um, come across this term quite a lot as in um, you know you would have a, a therapist a doctor a physician for your for your body and philosophy would be the therapy um, and the curing of the mind um, so yeah, I can only um, second what you said that um, it would have been quite um, natural um, to think about philosophy in um, in this kind of way in, in the in the way of seeing it as a psychological practice um one thing that i um found a very insightful thought um that kind of differentiates our understanding of what psychotherapy is and how we see philosophy um is that um, I, I found it quite insightful to think about it in a way uh, that Philosophy is um, trying to be a way to build resilience, and um, therapy is kind of after the fact when um, there is some something that you need help with. You go to see somebody, you speak to somebody who's who's um, trained and equipped to help you out of a difficult situation that you cannot handle um, yourself, perhaps. Um, and philosophy, to me, is um, kind of the step before that. Um, as a kind of preventative um, way of not letting uh, things uh, yeah, maybe get to that uh, point, perhaps. Um, so this is a, a very interesting thought, um, I feel. Um, but my personal um, background or my personal history into um, Stoicism um, has actually been through um, Donald Robertson. So for me, from the quite from the very beginning, um, I've had a, a strong connection to like the therapeutical practices of, of meditation, journaling, and visualization. Um, so, yeah, that's that's me. Uh, Abdul. Yeah, great. Thanks. 
Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, it's just interesting to see um, um, Stoicism uh, concepts or pillars proven uh, in the field of science, especially uh, in the field of psychology. Um, perhaps that should make people pursue it more. I mean, if they're seeking to improve their selves and well-being and uh, improve their life in general. Yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's um, uh, actually, actually just to make a, um, a small note, um, it's something I also found in this research was that there's actually not a lot of research on how, like psychological research, there's not a lot of psychological research in how stoicism affects affects your, uh, uh, let's say, recovery or your prevention of um, psychological distress, let's call it. And um, because they, most of the research is on CBT and most of like CBT is based on these um, assumptions in stoicism, but there's no, what I found interesting is that there's actually no rigorous scientific study on stoic effect on the mind. And there's some, I think, um, I didn't put it in, in the slide at the reference this slide yet, but um, uh, Shakam had, had sent me a good link to a um, an actual article on that. They wanted to um, uh, focus on um, uh, studying actually how stoicism affects um, people's uh, things like working memory, um, what they call uh, rumin rumination, which is constant uh, focusing on the past and how stoicism might help that, um, help re you recover from that and focus more on the present. Um, and so, yeah, but it's quite interesting that there's actually not a lot of research, as far as I understand Robertson and some others, that uh, on, on stoicism's effect. It's more about um, uh, CPT. Um, but, um, and then I, I would uh, uh, definitely agree with um, um, Philip when he said that, um, you know, it's, uh, it's something as well it'd be found is that stoicism is much more long term it just feels like something that is more wholesome um that the, perhaps that's um that's one of the key differences and you're right it's not um i would even go further like something i read something i was um one of uh robertson last um last words uh so it's something more than that. Like I think the big, another big difference between philosophy and psychology is that it's not just um, after the fact. Like CBT feels cold, you know, it feels like empty. Like you just do it to get better. But stoicism is there as more of a, it's much more valuable. When I say valuable, I mean like, you know, it, 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 it tries to impart values on your life. Um, it makes your life more fulfilling in general. So you never you never want to leave it. Whereas CBT doesn't really care about values. I think that's one of the big differences of CBT and stoicism is that CBT is good for coping mechanisms and dealing with life stresses, but it doesn't really have those four central values that are and virtues, excuse me, virtues that um, stoicism wants you to follow uh, and constantly try to achieve which I think was what something, for me anyway, what attracts me to stoicism is that it's just much more holistic. It's not just a coping mechanism. It's a way to live life and to live life virtuously. Yeah. Uh, Scott, uh, go ahead. Yeah, kind of uh, just to kind of dovetail on what everyone else is saying, and sorry I had to join late, I had some technical issues. But, um, but yeah, I kind of view... Like, if, if, if you need CBT, your philosophy of life has failed. Um, some, something about, you know, how you've set yourself up isn't working, and so all of a sudden you need help. So you go to a psychotherapist. The psychotherapist uses CBT kind of like a band-aid to be like, okay, so we've got this philosophy of life that, that you're trying to deal with. Let's, let's slap some, <laughs> let's slap a band-aid on this and try to, try to get you back to um, being a productive human again. Um, whereas stoicism is like the whole package. Like if you have the, the stoic philosophy of life, you odds are wouldn't need, uh, CBT because you already have a, a, a working philosophy of life. Um, and so what I find interesting is that generally the people, 
um, that I think get interested in Stoicism um, have had some sort of thing that has appeared in their life that has caused them to question their philosophy of life. Um, and then they seek out philosophy, well, a, a new philosophy, whatever that happens to be, and maybe they land on Stoicism. Um, but I do feel like there's kind of this connection to the starting point of either Stoicism or CBT, which is whatever philosophy of life you were using before didn't work <laughs> for whatever reason, and then now you're seeking something else. That's all I got. Yeah, I see it. Um, well, first of all, yeah, I think uh, psychology is for, you know, treating, treating uh, problems. And if you don't have any problems, you probably won't uh, seek, uh, like, advice or help anyway. Um, but, but I think uh, CBT can help you with future problems as well. Um, and stoicism as well. So, yeah, and what did you say? Yeah, yeah right. Uh, Philippe, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, I just wanted to um, say that I found your um, uh, insight, Scott, um, about um, just making uh, let's say a product, a person productive uh, or functioning again, very interesting, very insightful. Um, that uh, the goal um, is quite different. You know, it's like uh, therapy or CBT or therapy in general is, is aimed at, like you were saying, you know, make somebody um, productive, make somebody function uh, in society, whereas philosophy is actually um, that much deeper um, on that level that is meant um, to give you a framework to live your life by um so yeah, it's, a, it's a very very good insight uh, thank you for that thank you guys um yeah and scott hello welcome <laughs> um i didn't see anybody else come on um but um uh, it's good to have you here and um uh yeah I, that's a really good insight that's a really good um point you make uh, that not only is their underlying principles different, their their goals of what one wants to achieve. I mean, I, I and I do agree with Shakam that CBD could be used for like future or maybe preventative measures if you keep at it, like if you keep practicing um, some of the techniques uh, that CBT offers, which which we can get into later. I have on, a, on, a, on another slide, but it still I think feels barren. Like for example, you could. Um, focus on CBT and it helps you um, therapeutically for yourself, but it very little encourages you to go out in the world and um, be a good person. I mean, maybe there's a, maybe a, a byproduct of practicing CBT. And I don't know if there is, that's, I don't, I would have to do the research on that uh, or look at the research on that. But I would, I would tend to think that stoic, uh, the people who follow stoicism, uh, or another maybe well-meaning philosophy um, might have a uh, better intention or motivation to go out in the world, treat people in a better light or be virtuous or go out and volunteer. Like they, they would, they would have a philosophical and moral motivation to do that. Whereas people who practice CBT, again, maybe I feel like it, may, it could be a byproduct, but mm, it's, it's just for yourself and less about, helping other people. Um, and stoicism, there's that extra element of, no, you you have a responsibility to do that. You have a responsibility to affect change in the world that you can affect. Um, and um, the CBT just mm, maybe still differentiates between those internal and external events. But again, there's for me, there's more no moral element in a CBT, like there is in stoicism. Yeah, um, I think the CBT uh, hollowness is actually uh, quite useful, especially to um, practicing uh, stoic uh, or stoic uh, or such. Um, in CBT, they, they they can ask you to uh, define and clarify your your values. 
like nowhere they will say what exactly these values are. And if you take stoic virtues and use them as your guiding principles uh, for life, as your values, uh, I think you have a very good CBT experience. Um, because uh, clarifying your values, I think it's it's an integral part of the therapeutic process. Um, so we can say we have a, an easier time because like we have the, the values already. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, it's. Um... I think it could go either way as well. Like, I mean, I, I would um, I think many of us as well would choose stoicism as more, it's to sustain more over our lives. But you're right. I mean, to an extent, you could always supplement one or the other with whatever is lost or not there. Um, I wanted to go back to um, um, and the light. Can I say and, something? It, yeah, of course. Um, I just wondered when I uh, remember what you said in the beginning, like you were surprised that CPT is only like from the 60s or something. Um, I just remembered something which I learned like way back at school. Like, wasn't it like in the 50s that basically all assumptions in uh, psychology and psycho um, whatever changed and this behavioralism a theory became like a leading theory of the humans. The problem is I don't remember the details. I just thought maybe one, some of you know about that theory background in psychology or something to build the bridge to, um, yeah, to CBT. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I said the 50s. Um, but if, if your question is about like that, um, like what what happened during that time in the psychological field, in terms of how academics changed their assumptions, um, I I don't know I don't know about that um, because I don't know the history. But I, it was the fifties. That's what I read from Robertson is that it was the it was um actually it was Aaron Beck who in the fifties had um uh, had started um, it was Albert Ellis with RABT and Aaron Beck who started founding CBT in the fifties. Um, but I don't know exactly like. If you mean the, the the I guess a paradigm change, I'm not really sure um, how that paradigm yeah. change went. Yeah, yeah. Me, yeah, I also don't remember. I just remember this uh, um, the thing I the school of behavioralism that this were like the leading school at that time in the U.S. So I just remember that, um, but I don't remember the details. I just hope that. Maybe someone of you know about that, you know, change in uh, theor theory, like uh, basically a switch to 180 degree or something at that time. Mm -hmm. Maybe this was caused from the experiences of Second World War or something. I, I don't know. I'm just guessing. No, I would have to look it up. Sorry uh, for bringing this up. I hope it fits. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, part of the B part of CBT is a behave uh, is coming from a the behaviorism, and this is uh, Pavlov and uh, Skinner, um, and I think, yeah, Skinner is the American one, yeah, of course, um, and this was uh, in the forties uh, and fifties, but exactly when the paradigm shift uh, happened, I, I can't. Can't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't know if somebody has their other hand up, but um, uh, I would say just from my my research and education, my education masters, um, what I can say is that um, the shift to a more social, like intersocial and cognitive approach to psychology and learning learning theory specifically. I don't know about general psychology, but learning theory happened before the fifties. It happened. Um, uh, 30s and 40s um, that at least started to, to creep into the field. Um, there's actually a, a, a Russian man by the name of Vygotsky who had um, uh, proposed um, his uh, social theory of learning that 
actually he proposed in the early 20th century and then it kind of it took a little while to go a couple of decades to get to get to the US um, and then cog cognitive uh, learning theory and I guess might parallel cognitive psychology um, and you're right that that mainly happened in the 50s that that was a 50s thing I can't speak for psychology itself but um, cognitive learning theory was definitely in the 50s um, and that doesn't surprise me cognitive behavioral theory there are some things about behavior behaviorism that kind of stuck I think um, which which makes a lot of sense actually um, uh, when when we're talking about this, I'm thinking of Viktor Frankl from last week because um, uh, he had started writing and developing his logotherapy in you know in, in the 40s and 50s, and so I'm wondering if that was part of the shift because his I remember his shift was from uh, he, he wrote in the second part of his Man's Search for Meaning that shift from understanding uh, what he called um, psychosis to neurosis or um, uh, psychogenic um, factors of neurosis to neurogenic fo uh, factors of neurosis. And the key difference is that like for him, psycho referred to a psychology, but neuro was the Greek word which meant mind. So for him, he was also trying to transform uh, psychotherapy from this idea that it's um, psychologically, generally psychologically framed um, to specifically cognitively framed. Um, like he, he was actually trying to do that in his logotherapy and just clicked with me for now, right now. And uh, I wonder if that's also part of the general paradigm shift that was happening. Um, yeah, There's some connection back to the last couple of weeks. <laughs> So back to our light flagon, um, we have uh, we have just a half an hour, and then I wanted to get to a particular slide that really that really looks at specific techniques CPT and stoicism um, advocate for in handling your handling your emotions, handling your psychological distresses or events external to you. Um, but I wanted to touch upon some more light flagon um, and see if we have any anything to contribute more. Um, and I'm going to save the second question. How has practicing stoicism helped you? Maybe we save that for the second hour because the second hour we dedicate towards actually reflecting on how can stoicism particularly influence our personal lives and how we can use it in practice. Um, but maybe we skip to the, the third and fourth questions. Are there ways in which stoicism and CBT are different? I think we've already started talking about that actually. Um, uh, but perhaps a better question maybe we can we can spend some more time on is wh which would you prefer in the long run um, and and why I know we've spoken a little bit about this but are there more differences are there more similarities are there um, uh, mm, mm, or if, for instance CBT something I can begin with in regards to these questions I know this never talks about journaling which I thought was interesting I mean they always they always talk about um, noticing, uh, noticing your um, paying attention to your cognitive state, you know, um, your judgments, your opinions, um, and the external events external to you. Um, but they never specifically in any of the research, in any of the texts that I've read, they never specifically mention journaling. They mentioned negative visualization, and but they never specifically mentioned journaling. Um, and I wonder if that's I, if somebody else knows CBT better than I do or, or, or the rest of us do, um, maybe they can say something to that effect. Maybe they, CBT therapists do use journaling for their clients, um, but it's not something I've seen, actually. I wonder if that's a deficit, something a disadvantageous to CBT patients because they're, they don't, are not asked to journal um, or... Um, but anyway, that would be something that I would put into CBT. I mean, um, so that, that's something I definitely haven't read is journaling is absent from CBT um, research. Uh, but again, I don't know if in practice, the therapists actually tell their patients to journal. But that would be something I definitely input into CBT. Um, and at least with stoicism, like we said before, you have all that framework. You have a logical framework. You have a... Um, 
uh, you have an ethical framework that is beyond the coping mechanisms that you find in CBT. I just can't compare the two. Um, CBT is interesting just from a scientific standpoint. Like you can get scientific data on what, how stoicism could help us because it actually applies stoic principles, um, but it doesn't. It, it still is devoid of that stoic meaning. Um, but again, there is. Um, uh, I, I, I would hope that a therapist would at least contribute a bit more technique from stoicism. Uh, journaling, um, uh, for instance, um, some of the ancient stoic practices like Seneca had lived in poverty or you know lived in lived in discomforts for a little while in order to train themselves and adapt themselves. I just don't see in CBT. It's not. It's completely absent. I don't know if any of you guys thought differently. Um, yeah, journaling specifically, I also I couldn't find any examples. Um, there is a development uh, of uh, of uh, skills uh, and and uh, coping uh, mechanisms. Um, and uh, like after you develop uh, these uh, skills with the ther therapist. Um, you you need to like train in those uh, skills, right? Mostly like living uh, your life and um, uh, I say just through natural uh, daily life, uh, you'll face uh, difficulties uh, that you could apply uh, your skills. Um, but yeah, I think maybe. You know, journaling is is a technique for self uh, reflection, and if you do the reflection process with somebody else, is journaling really required? Um, personally, I think it it could always help. Um, what do you guys uh, think? Yeah, Philip. Uh, thanks, Jaka. Um, yeah. I, um, I I didn't think about this until you um, you said this just now, but maybe it's um, also related to what we were saying before that um, therapy and philosophy um, have different starting points where st uh, philosophy um, as a way uh, to build resilience, whereas therapy to deal with crisis in a way. And so um, maybe you'd have to ask how helpful uh, would it be in a situation of crisis to um, to maybe seek voluntary discomfort. And I think that might not be the greatest tool, but it's just you know my feeling. Um, but uh, as far as journaling goes, I could definitely see value um, just to um, one. Uh, be um, more aware of your own mental state, um, but also as a as a um, document to go back to to go over with your therapist, perhaps. Um, but uh, yeah, for for me, um, I quite um, I, I don't uh, try to live in poverty one day a year like Seneca did or anything like this but <laughs> but um I, I think this is actually um uh something that is really valuable in general in order to build resilience um things of that nature let's say um i don't know um, like general distinctions. yeah yeah exactly i like, think like fasting for example right um a um a reductionist mm -hmm. style of uh, living let's say you know where you don't try to um, increase your pleasure by external things, but by um, increasing contentness by removing superfluous things. But again, um, because of the different circumstances um, and, and points where CBT starts, um, it might not be a proper or um, called for tool in, in the arsenal, let's say. 
right? Because like if you if you're already in in a crisis, maybe the last thing you want to do is aggravate your circumstances and add more difficulty. That's a really good point. It's um that even though we we might criticize CBT for maybe being a little bit less long term than stoicism, less holistic than stoicism, I think maybe stoicism maybe fall short in a very specific area. And not fall short, but maybe CBT is a much more maybe useful, especially in that very immediate circumstance. Like if you are um, uh, um, having, um, in a very stressful, situ distressful situation, you are, there's this um, external event or quick automatic thought or judgment really Im impairing you at that time uh, that, I mean, I think stoicism has these parallels too. They have parallel techniques, but I think CBT with maybe it's um, such uh, now such reputed and well-studied um, techniques could help you in the very short term um, that it, it could, um, yeah, absolutely. It's, um, uh, discomforts are not uh, like a general thing. And that when I say general, I don't mean they're a universal technique, right? To, for for ad adaptability. Sometimes you, the whole idea is not to go into those discomforts sometimes because um, perhaps the whole idea is to cope with what you're dealing with right then and there, not discomfort. I don't think, um, I think when Marcus Aurelius was negatively visualizing all the terrible, foolish people he would meet that day, I don't think when he was talking to those, ther you know, terrible, foolish people, he would start sleeping on the floor or, you know, um, taking cold showers because that just adds fuel to the fire. So I think he started using other techniques. Um, uh, one of them being like, I remember reading that uh, he would have certain lines he would say to himself in his head to kind of keep himself in line to kind of I mean, keep himself measured and tolerant of what was ahead of him. Um, so yeah, it's not, it's not a universal thing, journaling and um, discomforts. Um, but yeah, like, like you said, like sometimes they do help and sometimes they're, I think they're missing from CBT, maybe a nice comp, uh, supplement that therapists there could, um, could take in and adapt and adapt with. Um. Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, it could be, and that's going to be the last thing I say uh, before I pass on the speaker. Uh, but um, yeah, maybe it could be uh, sort of a way out of CBT, right? Um, if we're saying that it's more um, for an acute situation that you're dealing with, CBT. Um, and uh, if we also agree that um, philosophy, stoicism in particular, is more of a long-term uh outlook on life, then it could be a um, a way to lead from CBT when the crisis has passed on to a more um, permanent uh, resilience building program like stoicism um, as a way of, you know, for, for therapists to release um, the patient into, um, yeah, out of care and into um, enabled in a way to to deal with life um, better than before. Uh, yeah, and there's also a um, resilience uh, building training that uh, Don Robertson uh, does. Uh, Scott, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the the one thing that I kind of wanted to add to this is that you know I view like most of Stoicism is about preventing you having mental issues when you get into a situation where CBT is about correcting or reacting um, to a situation that you've been put in. So they do have kind of these different um, functions and, and different kind of um, <clears throat> ways of operating because of that. Um, and it, I find that interesting that while stoicism is really bent on this, I'm going to, we're going to get ourselves into a mindset where we're not thwarted by everyday things. Um, actually, happens to work for cbt at all like i i, th I think it's kind of a, a weird uh a weird thing where you know if you look at all of kind of the stoic techniques they're really about prepping yourself for that big moment where you're going to be tested um as opposed to cbt which is like oh you've been tested and failed let me help you pick you pick you back up 
Um, and so, yeah, I do think that they do have their own strengths in, in different areas. But the, the one thing that I really want to kind of kind of hammer home here is that um, I think any philosophy of life will help you avoid CBT-like issues. So, like uh, uh, Epicureanism or Buddhism, like any, any sort of philosophy of life that's really kind of holistic and has, you know, kind of a comprehensive view of what to do with life um, will probably do enough to prevent you from needing something like CBT. Um, because we can argue about what is ultimately good, if it's pleasure, if it's virtue, if it's, you know, uh, whatever. But if you at least have a philosophy of life that's going to drive you in a particular direction, um, that's way better than not having one. <laughs> like, like, yeah. More than anything else, just have a philosophy of life. Um, and so anyway, that, that those are the kind of things I wanted to, to touch on. Yeah, um, I, oh, kick on, go ahead. So um, if a stoicism is more of a, like driver's uh, manual, how to drive in slippery roads in low light conditions, sometimes there are accidents. Um, if it's your mistake, if it's your, I don't know, uh, environment, your parents, your partners, um, some some stuff uh, is just not under your control as you know as we live streaming is on <laughs> um so yes uh, so um so that yes yeah, so, so the uh, uh cbt and psychology in general i think it's uh, just had, um, uh, just help to help you get get on your feet again after uh, the accident. Um, I don't think it's something that should follow you for the rest of of your life. Maybe in some mm -hmm. uh, like hard cases, you you'll need it. But uh, yeah, after. Uh, you overcame uh, the um, the major difficulty. Then you can no longer need uh, intensive care, and you can go back to just uh, following um, the driver's manual. That's all. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve. Uh, no, I, I think you guys said everything. Uh, in everything I wanted to say. <laughs> Uh, I thought Scott's comment was really it was really poignant that it's not maybe just stoicism. Actually, I think this was something that um, Robertson pointed out is that um, it's uh, it, 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 sure, sure stoicism might have its unique benefits, um, but something that in psychology um, doesn't do too often. But I think especially cognitive behavioral therapy tries to at least elicit in the patient. Um, they don't try to impart certain virtues or values, but they ask the patient to reevaluate their values and virtues in life. That I think that reorientation to general a, a, a virtue ethic framework might be what is missing in at least traditional psych psychotherapy is that um, they don't, again, I guess it's that dichotomy between um, um, remedial and preventative measures that maybe the preventative measures work well with philosophies like the in the Hellenistic period because they um, they are based so foundationally on virtues that ask the person to consistently over their lifetime practice them. Um, I also think they're they're nice and more concise. And when I think of wisdom, I think of all those specific techniques and and phrases that the Stoics use, um, and and so on and so forth with all the other virtues. I think virtues are also not just um, a way to sustain your motivation to keep with these techniques. They're, they're also a nice way to packet all these all these different techniques and f philosophies because, right, it's not just, if, um, like we had mentioned in our two-parter on Epic, um, Epicureanism, that Stoicism, Epicureanism, and the other Hellenistic philosophy shared some of these virtues of wisdom, um, uh, justice, temperance, and courage, that actually these were Aristotelian virtues that kind of just they, they took from him. And so I think generally virtue ethics is something that is 
nice and compact that you can always remember. Um, and some, so something you can live by. Uh, and they're much more sustaining. At least for me, they sustain my interest um, because if it was just about um, remembering the difference between external and internal events, I don't think I would be so interested in Stoicism. I think maybe generally the reason why we come to Epictetus and Epicurus um, that we, we see these virtues that they practice and want to emulate them. Um, which again is something that um, maybe we can start transitioning, um, but I, I kind of just wanted to move to the next, uh, to this, this slide I made. I kind of copied down, this is not me, this, this is Robertson. I just basically copied his list of techniques down into the PowerPoint. So we kind of always have them at our disposal. Um, um, but I wanted to point out was something about connected to these virtue ethics was, um, uh, let's see if I, if I find it here. Uh, contemplating the sage on the bottom left, um, uh, always idealize, always visualizing this ideal other. Um, and I think the same goes for any virtue ethic system. Epicureans might think of Epicurus. Um, Stoic, Stoics might think of their, I guess, more preferred uh, late Stoic um, uh, writer, uh, and so on and so forth. And I think idealizing that specific practice, for example, um, could I think be applied to all kinds of other philosophies? Um, I'm not hearing any hands raised, so it is just the cusp of five o'clock. And I think we can begin transitioning into that in that second part, because I actually think this topic on CBT is less about talking about the philosophy of CPT or the theory uh, behind it paralleling Stoicism and CBT. And I think it's more interesting if we talk about the specific techniques um, that perhaps we can use in CBT and that also straddles Stoicism. Um, I think just going back to the light frog and we would ask ourselves, um, are there, um, how has practicing Stoicism helped you? Um, or how has, how can practicing Stoicism and it's particular techniques help you um, as well as in CBT. Because I think all of these techniques that we see here, uh, Robertson pointed out, um, are maybe perhaps historically, they're primarily stoicism techniques. But you know, today they're also they also have parallels in CBT um, and in and in RB or EBT, which is like a, a kind of sub theory, sub um, or a pre-therapeutic technique, um, Beck, who um, has founded or a little bit predates modern uh, cognitive behavior therapy, um, it's used. Uh, these are not just used in stoicism, these are all also used in CBT. Um, so I, I just I just happened to reference CBT where it was, where Robertson had, um, had specifically um, mentioned uh, a specific parallel to CBT, but I'm very confident these are all also used at least in part uh, in modern, modern modern cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, so our light frogging for this next hour is essentially this. Um, what do you see on this list that can help you? How has this helped you? So perhaps have you experienced CBT? Have you experienced with some of these stoic techniques that have helped you in the past? Um, you can share, you can treat this as a sharing center and, and share your story, your experience, um, or you can reflect on how it could help you in the future. You can um, perhaps use the same technique of um, uh, contrasting consequences you see on the left. You can also reflect on what might happen in the future with you and then reflect how you could use some of these techniques to help you through that situation. Um, so I'll open it up to the floor. How can these help you or how, how have these helped you in the past? Um, Steve, do you mean uh, in, a, in the context of a therapy session or in general? Like it isn't clear to me. No, no, no. It's not necessarily a therapy session. I'm not asking you, have you gone through CBT, seen a therapist, and what, has they, what have they um, helped you in terms of techniques and uh, recommendations? Absolutely not. I mean, you could if you want to. I'm not, I would never ask you something like that if 
you feel uncomfortable about it. But I mean, just generally in your life as a, in practical experience, um, how have these in part or in whole helped you um, specifically uh, or unspecifically just reflecting generally? Or if you, you can't uh, perhaps remember something in the past, contemplate how it can help you in the future. And so not necessarily about a therapy session. Um, why I asked about the therapy session, I just imagine that this is used in um, Gesprächstherapie, uh, like uh, in this method of therapy. I mean, you can easily apply it, right? That's why I was wondering if you had the therapy context in mind or, or any context in life. No, not at all. I, again, I, 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 I had just... <laughs> I wouldn't say copied and pasted. I, I just boiled it down to the to the titles of these techniques. But I, I basically just trans, transferred what Robertson had listed out a nice, I think, 17, 18 point list to this PowerPoint slide. And I had no uh, in anticipation that these would we would connect these to how they would actually be used in therapy. Um, for for example, um, I do often contrast consequences. This is something that I noticed. Perhaps the only um, one of the only techniques I had used before encountering stoicism was that I had realized I've been doing that most of my life. Often what helps me is that in contrasting consequences, I was actually, um, it was on Tuesday this past week, most recent memory of mine. Um, I had a, um, an important um, meeting to attend with, um, my boss and one of our other uh, colleagues. Um, and I know the, um, discussion was contentious. And I didn't, I, I, I needed to kind of visualize what's going to happen. And so sometimes I contemplated the worst that she could say and how I could ideally, um, I guess this also uses contemplating the sage, um, uh, kind of contemplating that ideal other. I was contemplating what I could do ideally. Um, uh, and then I also um, asked myself, what if she doesn't? Or, or what if um, uh, my boss? Because this this is a personal com this is a personal conversation that kind of um, or a um, uh, a professional conversation dealing with a kind of a internal dispute that we had in the um, uh, that it's all I kind of want to say, but it was a um, dispute between us um, that we needed to have a meeting about, and I felt a little bit anxious about it, and so which is quite natural. Something the Stoics understand is some natural judgment you have about a situation but in order to deal with that i kind of contrasted what could happen if she said this if i said that and what goes on there and what goes on there and how i could deal with it um but i mean just in the short run uh, just to make a short story short uh, excuse me to um to say that i've been using this all my or most of my life as far as i can remember and it was just something that has always helped me naturally um uh and it's um it's something that I feel is the most helpful to me um, because I can't visualize what's going to happen in the future uh, and then, or what not, what will happen, but what can happen and then deconstruct how I could act. Um, and I can never visualize everything that could happen, but it's, um, it's quite useful and when I do that and I break it down and say to myself, because sometimes in my head, I also, I also visualize what I could, could say wrong. I also visualize, oh, um, that's a terrible way to act. And then I, I take a step back and say, I got to do that differently. Um, because that also really helps when I visualize something I would do terribly wrong, because then I know for sure that's the that's the wrong thing to do or say. And I can always, um, uh, because I understand the consequences of doing that. And so I, I take a step back and I say, no, I'm going to do this differently. Like, how would a stoic Act. How would somebody who um, really understands these principles act or wants to act ethically and morally and caring act and how they speak? Um, just a very recent memory of mine, I had this big discussion with my boss on Tuesday. And so that was something I had used right before. And that's an example I'm speaking of when I say it does not have to be something you take from a therapy session you've had. It just has to be um, 
uh, taken from a personal experience that you've had. And if you've used any of these you, these techniques in your personal life apart from a, from a psychotherapist. Yeah, um, Scott? Yeah, like I, I've, I've practiced stoicism long enough that I think I've used all of these um, at some point. But uh, the one that I kind of find, um, uh, I don't know if I want to say the most useful, but the most kind of interesting is memorizing words of wisdom. Because like the Enchiridion was really just kind of this loose collection of short phrases to kind of, you know, as tools that you could just kind of pull out of the tool bag uh, real quick. Um, and while there's lots of stoic, you know, phrases and whatever to kind of pull out of the tool bag, um, I'll, I'll use anything, anything that kind of helps me get into a good frame of mind or reminds me of uh, what I need to be thinking about. Um, any quote will do. So, you know, everything, you know, you know, I don't, I don't limit it to just the, the stoics. It's like, um, without struggle, there is no progress uh, is a great one that I like. And uh, just do it. I mean, even marketing campaigns or whatever can uh, can have a nugget of truth to them. And if you use the tool in the right context, um, then it can be a great, useful thing uh, whenever you're in a particular situation. Just remind yourself of, oh, this is, this is what I need to be thinking about in this situation. Um, but the other, the counterpoint to that is knowing which tool to use. That's kind of the important thing. Um, not, it, you can't take one of these tools that's listed here and, and uh, use it in every single situation and have it be really, really effective. Like the reason there are multiple tools is because there are different situations and uh, different approaches to kind of get your mind into uh, that right kind of context to make that rational reason choice as opposed to um, letting emotion kind of take and drive you drive over. So one of the things that I try to do is keep a list of quotes um, just in a file, like I don't carry it around with me or anything, but um, uh, just to, to kind of refresh myself from time to time with the different tools that I can use and kind of apply on a day to day basis. That's all I got. Thanks. Um, I'm going to give a slight counter uh, example, maybe, because um, recently I've been finding it very difficult to keep up with my practice. And um, I can see the negative effect. And um, yeah, so, so um, I used to um, journal regularly, meditate on um, yeah, diff different different things uh, regularly, uh, daily even. And um, I found it um, really helpful in, in um, for example, uh, having a looser attachment to my own opinions because I realize it's just um, an opinion. And what's it's, it's not, you know, the most important thing to be right in an argument, for example. What's more important is that, um, you know, I um, overcome the, the disagreement with my partner and uh, we value the time that we spend together and we don't spend the time being annoyed at each other, for example, over something that's relatively incon un inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. Um, and since I've stopped, or well, since I've, since I've um, been less, um, how do you say, uh, less prudent and less um, been practicing less regularly. Um, I've seen a lot of those old habits that um, I've kind of had under control creep back in. So I'm I'm more argumentative. I'm more attached to my own opinion, trying to be right rather than um, trying to end an argument. And um, yeah, it's definitely a stark reminder that um, I should follow up with my practice again. And um, this one small example um, that I have in mind from recent memory is, um, I've mentioned this briefly in the in the Telegram group two weeks ago, I've had a small car accident. Um, and uh, that's why I couldn't make it to one of the sessions. Um, and um, it was just such a powerful reminder for me to um, to try to keep my 
uh, practice up because I came back home after everything was done and um, I was standing in the bathroom. I was still a little bit shaken. I was standing in front of the mirror and um, I was just trying to calm myself down. And I just remembered all those things that I used to practice on a regular basis, like negative visualization and acceptance and all of those things. And I was standing there and I was just telling myself that, you know, this is fine. It's done. It's a good thing. Nobody's injured. It's just going to cost a bit of money and like, that's it. And you know, like at the end of the day, that's fine. And it's good that it happened to you, right? Accepting it for what it was. And it could have been, you know, worse than it turned out to be. It's good that it happened to you because like, yeah, I can, I can, I can deal with the um, insurance. I can deal with the, the money and it's not going to, you know, cost me, um, I don't have to take a credit to pay for things now. And so in, in a way it's good it happened to me. It's good that I have the tools at my disposal to deal with this situation. And just reminding myself of this really helped me to just come down, look at it in a different way and and um, just calm myself down. Um, so yeah, this is just, like I said, a very powerful reminder for me that um, I want to um yeah get back on on track with the practices that i've been keeping up for such a long time and that i've neglected over the past weeks thank you scott and um and philip yeah um yeah, Phil, philip it, it sounds like you're um i'm just trying to pick out something from this list that it, it looks it sounds like you're um using this idea of objective representation which i think judging from the mm -hmm. um uh, the the Greek word, uh, this the, these phantasia the Greeks talked about were um, these um, phantasms, these um, irrational thoughts and passions you would have. And it sounded like what you were doing was kind of putting them into an objective perspective and um, uh, understanding that, like you said, like actually you used that and then you went to a word of wisdom you had. You said, this is okay, this is fine, it was in the past, I can move forward, actually, I'm, it's good that I'm alive and I'm okay. And you know, this is, this sounds exactly like what, you, what you've what you been doing. Um, yeah, definitely. I, hmm. uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, um, definitely that. And um, uh, also, um, yeah, I, I think the term is not stoic, but, you know, um, embracing the things that have happened. Um, uh, Amor mm. uh right? Embracing, um, okay, it is it is done. It's it's good that it happened to me. Right? Thinking about it this way, loving the fact that, that um, it is me that this has happened to because I can learn from it, I can grow from it, I can use this um, as something to um, to my advantage, even right? Because it is a reminder that um, I have these experiences and I have the tools, and I just need to use it. I think um, actually, actually, there is a, there is a stoic word. Actually, I'm just looking at this list, and I think, I mean, we would say apathy, but it's not the right translation, mm -hmm. right? To, at least as far as we mean it now. But I think the correct stoic word would be apatheia, just accepting what happened, just be like, yeah, it happened, and I'm indifferent towards it. And yeah. more than that, now I can um, I can use that information to kind of um, maybe not not put myself in the same situation the next time or, or take that as a lesson or a change in the future. And I mean, however, however you needed to use it, I think that, I think that actually is the, what the Stoics would have done is understand them, understand it from an indifferent perspective and just accept it as it is. I like the word embracing though. I, I like, I like what you said, em embracing it. It's not just about accepting it, it's embracing the fact that, yeah, it happened. Um, that sounds like a much better, um, better word to use because acceptance is, um, I understand the, I understand the idea of acceptance and indifference, but when you say embracing it, it, um, you really take it in and then you really digest it and, um, you don't forget about it, right? It's not ignorance. It's, um, ignorance of what happened. It's, a, it's embracing what happened and storing that for, further use and, and learning, which I thought was a much better way to put it. Yeah. Uh, Abdul, uh, did you want uh, to speak? Um, yeah, thanks. It's 
it was just a quick comment um, about stoicism versus uh, CBT or maybe counseling, generally speaking. Um, it's, it's great to have both of the options in hand. I mean, suppose someone who has never been exposed to stoicism before um, and went into tragedy. Um, like, and he did a bit of research or they did a bit of research and found out, okay, you can either seek counseling or follow um, a philosophical thoughts or concepts such as, uh, I mean, or follow, follow a philosophy such as stoicism. Um, then I think maybe the faster option then is to go with the counseling session because I feel it takes time to adapt into um, the uh, stoic principles or any philosophy. So for example, say the dichotomy of control. It's great that you think of what you what's in your control, not not with what what's out of your control, and I do enjoy uh, the fact that okay, it, it's up to you what you can do and you control. But sometimes you need further guidance. For example, if you if you new to philosophy or uh, stoicism and you don't know anyone in particular who follows this philosophy, uh, then you cannot seek another stoic advice. But then you can. Uh, seek maybe um, a therapeutic advice and you need maybe sometimes extensive guidance to get out of this uh, get out of this tragedy instead of maybe maybe someone who's not keen on learning about philosophy and just want to get out of trouble they're facing um, but again I think both options are valid and and uh, both options have got their own pros and cons. But, uh, yeah, m maybe that's a different perspective of thinking about it. No, I, I agree. And um, they're both uh, offering um, a set of tools uh, that can be very useful in certain situation, situations. Um, and uh, I, I do think uh, CBT can be like hollow and um, not very supporting in the um, yeah like it has like no ethical framework uh, nothing like that um, but when you understand it's a, a very specific tool, just uh, the stitches uh, to close uh, the wounds, uh, I think uh, then you, you are able to use it uh, um, better and more precisely. Uh, Marcus? Yes, thank you. Um... I just want to add an example where the, the Stoic quote helped me. I'm not sure if, it, uh, if it's actually on the list, but I found it so useful that I wanted to share it. I'm not sure if it's fine. Um, sure. Uh, well, it actually came from a YouTube video that I will post in the chat in a moment. Uh, it's a quote from um, uh, William Irvine, and his apparently it's from a, book, a guide to the good life that I haven't read. And, uh, it's it's more of the voluntary discomfort uh, kind, but uh, it's written like that I haven't uh, uh, unit the voluntary discomfort philosophy uh, or with voluntary discomfort part uh, that I haven't visualized it yet um, from that light. And well, what 
I did is basically, well, I applied not to well, a part, to different persons because I'm someone who, um, well, I'm someone who sometimes fears judgment for, uh, from others and uh, proactively tries to um, avoid conflict or, uh, and, well, I, I'm trying to, uh, apply this uh, in life to uh, well train myself to be uh, less afraid of conflict or disdain from others even um, even you can even apply this to well I, I'm trying to apply this to my inner motor so to speak to my own inner boss uh because well the, actually uh, i'm trying to not be afraid of uh, my inner judgment not not of uh, my mental model of other people so to speak well uh, it, it's a bit uh, out of context so <laughs> Uh, um, I mean, no, um, it's, uh, yeah, not at all. It's not out of context. And it's, if we can add another technique to this list, that's fantastic. It's just another tool in our repertoire. Um, I, I didn't understand quite though what you, what you were describing. So, I mean, I think the last part, I think maybe summarized it, you were saying that, um, uh, you focus more on your, um, or you, you, you try to, um, uh, um, you try to uh, focus, or what's the, what's a better word for it? Uh, you try to deal with your inner judgment um, uh, more than you do. Um, I, I didn't quite get what you meant, though, um, because uh, and, and and the actual technique you were you were applying. Yeah, what I meant is. Um... <laughs> Well, I, I, conformity is very important uh, to me to, to try to not stand out, not to uh, trigger the stand of others, uh, like in the quote. And um, well, I, not only am I, am I trying to train to not to no longer be afraid of uh, judgment and, and things like that, and in general, uh -huh. hmm. and since uh, and I'm trying to go a step further because I'm since I'm not actually afraid of others, but uh, of my interpretation uh, of my uh, mental model, so to speak, of, of, of what I would expect would happen. Um, well, so I'm trying to put myself in situations where. Um, I would train myself to be more resilient to, and to um, uh, well, it's, it's some kind of feedback loop. How <laughs> 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 to describe? Mm. Okay, now I better understand. Okay, so it's um, it's about coming out of uh, and conformity is not always bad. I think that's also what you're saying. It's not. It's not necessarily. A bad thing um, to conform or to be like the crowd, but I, I, what you know, from what I'm understanding is that the the goal of perhaps um, what you're focusing on on now is when you're bettering yourself is to uh, try and not care or try to care less about the judgments of others when you do stand out or when you do present yourself as unique, um, uh, which I think is good. I mean, it's uh, it's not necessarily a statement that says you should stand out, but it's a statement that says uh, you shouldn't care if you happen to stand out, right? Um, uh, I would. Um, it's. I think you're right. It's not. There's not one Stoic principle or CBT technique that addresses that, but I think there's a couple. Uh, for example, the dichotomy of control and sovereign principle. You see, uh, in, you treat those other people's judgments. So they they are they have judgments about you, 
and you treat them as external events. You treat them as things that um, you can't control. So they're judgments that they have. They're not. They're not specific reasons that they have against you. They're just judgments about your 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 standing out. And then they're external events. They're things not at not in your control. I mean, maybe they they come around and they you know de uh, judgmentalize you, but they that's not something that you can force happen. Um, so I think that in order to like achieve that goal, it's, it's definitely within bounds that CBT and stoicism have, have looked for already. Um, uh, thank you. Um, and I, I also wanted to mention something Abdul mentioned. Um, uh, and I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think, um, Abdul and Shakam were speaking about this, that it's, um, it's impossible for a person who's never heard of stoicism or some of the stoic a lot of the stoic techniques or, or cbd techniques um to actually use them in practice i mean sometimes you naturally like i was saying you naturally come to a certain technique on your own um but it's either rare or it's uh you do it you do it sometimes but you, you can never naturally come to all these conclusions by yourself uh, not even the stoics did that they had to capital capitalize on each other's philosophy over generations and um i think the only reason philip and i for example were able to deal with their past situations is because like with philip when you were saying you were in the shower i mean your mind was had enough knowledge and understanding of these principles and techniques that it could use them at their disposal. It's like having a hammer in your house. You know, if you never have a hammer in your house, you can never put a nail in your wall. But if you have one, you could you could fix that. So it's um, it's you. I think we would never try to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> but so I think you're absolutely right, Abdul. When when you first said this, that you, you should absolutely if somebody's having too difficult of time to deal with the situation and they can't do it alone maybe suggest to them another person to talk to uh, if not if not a s friend or um yourself then a therapist because that maybe provides a gateway to some of these techniques that they can use um that they can then, then use by themselves in the future um i think some of us i, I um i i can say that i've um uh, I haven't been to a, I, I had been to a therapist once a long time ago back in university. Um, but since then, I've been very lucky never having gone to one. And then also, um, you know, introducing myself to these, these, these stoic practices, because I've been very lucky and fortunate to be able to use them at my disposal whenever I need to, because now I, now I have that knowledge. Now I have this understanding. Yeah, um, I wanted uh, to talk about uh, mm -hmm. how negative uh, visualization uh, can be a great tool, uh, but uh, if you overdo it, uh, like I have a, a very strong tendency to do, um, it can uh, lead uh, to uh, to anxiety. Um, and it took me it took me a while to to find um, the balance or how to uh, to say enough. That's um, you know I explored uh, this uh, situation uh, to a certain degree, and that's all I need to do. Um, because my my natural tendency is to explore uh, situations in a in a like a, a fractal way um where a, a scary a conversation can go a thousand different ways and lead to a million different uh, <laughs> futures um and which most of them uh, are probably terrifying. And so um, for 
quite a large a portion of my life, I I focused on all these scary futures, scary possibilities. Um, but since I, I started um, like learning and uh, studying uh, stoicism, um, I understood that I don't need to to go that far. And also, if I write things down um, in a, a, if I just write a couple of sentences of the negative visualization, then it's not so endless and uh, fractal and scary. It's very defined and sometimes even manageable. And and I think it's a, uh, it it can be similar to a, a Marcus. Um, how did you did you say um, your um, how you you how the mental uh, image of other people? Mm. Yeah, um, the possibilities are are endless. And to try to imagine all the all these faces people might have is is just a terrifying experience. But if you if you collapse these uh, possibilities, um, if you write it down, maybe you can uh, do it without write, writing it down. Um, then you see that maybe people have only one face and it's not that awful. And maybe the, the scary conversation can go two, three ways and I can prepare to those um, uh, futures and, and, say, and face it without the anxiety. The uh, de uh, decatastrophizing, uh, mm. I think uh, <laughs> it's a very good, uh, it's a very useful tool. Um, yeah, it's. I was thinking when you said overdoing negative visualization, I was thinking of a couple of things like um, how we noticed last week or a couple of weeks ago, actually, when we were um, in one of the two weeks on Victor Frankl, we mentioned that he, in his, in the camp uh, at Auschwitz, he had, um, in order to deal with stressful situations like walking in the snow barefoot to go work, he, um, he would often think of his wife. And um, that was an example of positive visualization. So, and I think it's not, you know, it's not, Negative visualization is the only kind of visualization that um, sometimes you need to kind of switch to positive visualization or another technique um, because it's perhaps in that case different. I also think it's good. And you know, when you switch techniques, I think um, that can um, that can make your mind a bit more flexible and can make it can, it can also uh, maybe de-stress your mind. Because if your mind, you're right, if your mind negatively visualizes what could happen in the future too much, I think. It, um, yeah. It uh, has to go. So. Uh, Who does? Ah, okay. Scott. So. Ah, okay. Scott, nice thank you so much for joining. Uh, you um, bet. Thanks for having me. Scott, I, yeah, I just saw you here. Um, I didn't realize you came up. Um, do you mind before you leave just introducing yourself? Um, we usually do this at the very beginning, but it'd be nice to hear from you uh, and uh, for the others to hear from you. Oh, sure. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, so I'm Scott Sanders. Um, I'm one of the board members of the Stoic Fellowship. Um, the Stoic Fellowship, uh, I don't know how much they've introduced, but um, we're just a loose collection of meetup groups from around the world. Uh, the Learn Stoics are one. Um, I am the uh, facilitator for the Denver Stoics here in the U U.S. And uh, yeah, and so uh, I'm in charge of the resource group and trying to help facilitators around the world uh, kind of lead better meetups and uh, do whatever I can to kind of uh, 
help facilitate or facilitate, if you will. So at any rate, that's kind of my role. And I just wanted to hop on and uh, see how the Berlin Stokes are going, getting along. And uh, you guys are doing great. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Scott, for uh, last week, I remember the, the workshop. And uh, thank you for joining. I'm really happy you made it. Sure, no problem. All right, everyone. Thanks for letting me join and have a good day. You too. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, that's actually something I, I realized I, I should do is, um, uh, in, um, uh, uh, we are a, um, as, as Scott was mentioning, um, I actually went to a facilitator's workshop last week. That's where I got the idea for the visual. I thought it just might be, um, might be useful for us because even in an open discussion, just having something to look at really helps us just kind of stay on, stay on point. Uh, and the other thing is that, um, yeah, so, uh, I registered the Berlin Stoics with a collection of Stoic uh, chapters around the world called the Stoic Fellowship, completely optional to join. But I mean, what the benefit, the primary benefit is that you basically get people like him to come over and uh, um, uh, chat with you. We had a couple weeks ago, we had Dan come over from Florida, um, join one of our one of our meetups online. And um, uh, we are, uh, they also break up uh, Stoic chapters into regions. For example, we're in the Central Europe region of the Stoic Fellowship. So there might be, there will be chances that I can kind of get in contact with other chapters in the area. We can kind of maybe do a, a joint session. We can have other Stoic members come in and, and uh, join us, um, which would be quite interesting. Um, so I realized that I should put in the, in the slides, uh, like uh, the Stoic Fellowship logo, just to kind of reference them, it would be good to, uh, um, to show that we're also part of a, I guess, an international fellowship you can you can you can say it um but yeah so uh yeah i was um <laughs> i was calling him george i think in the beginning I, I don't know why it was george or gregory it was gregory there's a gregory at the stoic fellowship i got an email from and uh, i f was always thinking of his name as gregory <laughs> and uh when i heard his voice i was like all oh, right, right it's scott <laughs> so uh I can start sharing my screen again. And we can continue maybe for the next um, uh, 25 minutes. We have more time. I just also wanted to mention something about um, negative visualization. I was thinking uh, it would be really great to also make this a, um, a two-parter. Uh, so we, we do CBT next week. And I was thinking we can go into the details of one of or two of these techniques. For example, we can go into the details of negative visualization, journaling, positive visualization, uh, maybe um, uh, contemplating the sage, dichotomy of control, maybe just uh, like a select few and just focus on those and focus on, we can bring up the scientific research on them. We can bring up, because there's actually also a nice way that Robertson uh, mentions you should do journaling, for example. He has like a, or no, it was, um, uh, there was a nice summary of it in the scientific article you, you sent me, Shikhan, um, on that was researching stoic effects on um, uh, dealing with emotional distress. And it nicely encapsulated like a three or four part process that stoic journaling goes through. Um, not too different than how we usually describe it. Um, start by visualizing um, and writing down what you could expect in the future. Um, uh, then um, uh, in the morning, right? And then in the second part, um, reflect on what has happened. And then the third part, reflect on what has what is to come. So you can maybe go into like details about some of these techniques in the next week. Um, yeah, just a thought that we can, um, because I don't want CBT to kind of just be a rehash of what we did this week, but maybe go into details about some of them, um, uh, which would be interesting. I think, um, um, at, yeah, sorry. sorry go ahead. Yeah, I would no, be no, no. keen on knowing more about uh, dichotomy of control. Um, and also another thing is um, I would um, it would be great if there's like a, fel a fellowship to join stoicism fellowship because uh, as you may know I'm new to stoicism and uh, I do overthink sometimes so if you kept it to me to dig in and search and 
yeah, I may get too curious and get myself overwhelmed. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I would I would appreciate some like guided program to say okay, those are the basics. You need to go through them, then you go upscale, maybe somewhere else. Um, no, I'm really happy you mentioned that. I think what we could I, I, I've I've thought about a few things. Um, I mean, I've thought about a a whole introductory meetup on stoicism for anybody who's never come, um, but for us. Maybe it's um, maybe you're right. Maybe we still need um, some guidance. Um, there's two things. One, Robertson does have a um, uh, mentioned on here in the bottom question. Uh, so I guess you would answer yes to this question. <laughs> um, Robertson does offer a yearly. Uh, I think it's four or eight weeks. I can't remember in my head right now, but it's a, a multiple week program on stoic mindfulness and resilience training. He hasn't. Uh, he hasn't actually, um, and I think somebody shared the link right now. Um, he hasn't actually posted the date. Usually he makes a date for it, but he hasn't posted the date for 2021 yet. It's still to be determined. Um, so whenever he determines that, we'll let you know. We'll let the whole Stoic Berlin Stoics know. Um, and uh, it's up to you if you want to join. Um, it's a commitment, though. Like his specific training program is a, a multi-week program that you have to commit twenty to thirty minutes a day at. So you have to really, pretty, pretty, be pretty consistent at it. Um, but we can also do that. We can also, um, uh, for the next week, we can pick out uh, two or three techniques listed on this list, and then specifically guide ourselves next week um, how to actually go through those techniques. Um, we can actually do a short session. If we have a negative visualization session, we can spend 30 minutes of negative uh, or 20 minutes of negative visualization and then spend the next 20 minutes reflecting on that and how it went. Um, and we can go through guided practices. And then we did a session last semester about, um, uh, we had a, a two session um, practice on meditation, and guided meditation practices and guided negative visualization practices. Um, and I think, Knowing what I know now, we can do better. We can um, maybe go more deeply into negative visualization. Um, and especially, you're right, the dichotomy of control may be good to go over. It's um, often mentioned, uh, it's one of the most foundational principles of stoicism, but perhaps um, perhaps there is a good um, guided program I can um, maybe find some resources to help us with uh, because Often the thing that they talk about in the dichotomy of control is not just that there are external and internal events, right? The whole, the whole purpose of the virtue of wisdom is to know the difference of those external and internal events. And sometimes it's not always, sometimes it's in the gray area, right? And sometimes it's not clear cut if, if there's an external and internal event. So I think that's a really good point. Maybe we should do like, um, maybe we should include dichotomy of control in there because it's, it's often stated, but, um, it's uh, maybe not well understood how to put it into practice, even for myself. I, I, yeah, might be good to like reflect on that. Yeah, uh, I can just put the uh, text from the Enchiridion. Um, I started. Uh, it, it's it looks very very long uh, on the. Um, did see a chat, but uh, it's like two chapters, and that's the whole basically the whole uh, idea of dichotomy of control. That's where it came from, from Epictetus, um, like first two chapters. Yeah, uh, I think it's um, I think it's actually I don't even have to look at it. I think the the first line at the Enchiridion is. There are things you can control and things you can't control. Like he, it's the first sentence, literally, of the whole of his whole Enchiridion. So it's um, it's so foundational that that's what he bases his entire work on. Yeah, uh, to achieve freedom and, uh, and happiness, you need to grasp uh, this basic truth: some uh, things in life are under your control, and others are not. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um but uh yeah as I, as I said before i think it's such a basic and helpful tool um maybe 
does deserve uh, a whole meetup uh, dedicated to it. Um, no, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's something that we should um, <laughs> we could do. Yeah, theoretically, we could do a whole um, uh, another many meetups on. Um, actually, just thinking about it, maybe in the future we and in the, even the near future we could do a meetup on Epictetus. I think we've done one on, um, we've spoken about Seneca. Um, I think we haven't done a meetup on Epictetus since the very beginning, but maybe we do something specifically in the Caridian and the dichotomy of control. Um, um, and uh, yeah, it would be good to uh, really pull resources. Like for example, in the dichotomy of control, when I was um, reading these resources, uh, making connections to other, um, to other past meetups. Like I remember whole Victor Frankl's um, idea of responsibleness. He doesn't use the word responsibility. He says responsibleness. So I don't know why he sound, maybe sounds a little bit like a, a, a better word as a, if you want to name a principle. Um, and um, he, I think that goes very much in line with external and internal events. He talks about the, um, the wisdom to basically know um when to be responsible for something and when to be free from something you can't control. Um, he, he, he builds his dichotomy of control right into it. Um, uh, which, so I think we can also pull from his, um, um, from his work, from his local therapy, um, some guidance on how to actually practice this dichotomy of control. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I, I started uh, my uh, self-help, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to call it, um, journey uh, with uh, James Clear um, Atomic Habits. And it has uh, some CBT elements. Um, and now I feel it's like a, a full circle. Um, through uh, stoicism and and everything, and now I uh, now I feel um, how um, if the CBT tools are like a bandage, um, the um, the practices in uh, Atomic Habits are like a, like crutches or like a cast. A, it's more long term, and it can help you set your bones uh, straight <laughs> and prevent uh, damage in the future. Um, because I don't know, we're not uh, born uh, with uh, uh, healthy coping skills. Uh, if we were, we wouldn't need uh, psychology at all. Um, so, uh, so I think we still need uh, psychology, even if we didn't uh, had any huge accidents. And even if it's a bit more to a, um, uh, how say, like shallow and behavioristic, uh, Atomic Habits also has uh, some really nice. Um, practices mm. um, yeah now after after these years um i think uh, i think i was missing uh, the more um you know the, the virtue virtues part um like the guiding principles mm. uh, because just the practice just the practice like the the practical things it didn't really satisfy me. I, I I think maybe it's just me or uh, all human race. They need a why, <laughs> not just how. Yeah. Um, so now connecting stoicism back to atomic habits. Now I see the now I see the how, uh, and I have the why. <laughs> It's a really good way to put it. Really, really poignant way to put it. Um, 
I don't know if. Yeah, I don't. I, I, maybe uh, I, I never read Atomic Habits, but that's something that I maybe I have noticed as well. Is that uh, there was never. I mean, we we knew maybe a few techniques, but the how was never really there until maybe we discovered more of these parallels with CBT. Um, I was also I was also going to say. Um, Something which escapes my mind now. <laughs> um, yeah, God knows what I was going to say. <laughs> um, but I really like that. it's uh, We've answered the why already. Stoicism provides that. And I think maybe CBT helps to at least shed light on that how uh, to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And um, is there any way to share a like Amazon uh, books. I think the DRM is like, I can just copy the files and uh, share them, right? You won't be able to open it. If I want to share a like... Mm, a, not sure. Don't Robert, so build your resilience and atomic ha habits. It wouldn't let me just copy the files, right? Do you mean... Um, if it, yeah. Do you mean legally or illegally? <laughs> uh, I assume illegally, but yeah. Uh, hang on a sec. Um, a tool that's uh, here would save uh, like, like this is um, basically a like it's it's you download it off the server basically, so it's not like torrent. Um, I when I was traveling, um, I didn't want to take a lot of books with me, so that's how I found about it. So um, I like downloaded it on Kindle, and then I bought the books afterwards after I read them. Um, but you can find basically anything there. Um, I downloaded a lot of very good books on basically, yeah, anything like even like a fairly um, obscure and um, academic stuff you can sometimes find. Thank you. <laughs> Valuable resource. <laughs> Valuable resource, but I do want to advocate for buying books. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, if, yeah. if for no other reason than that it looks really educated if you have them uh, behind you. <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, I can't uh, look at educated.